Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to give it uh, some more time. Um, oh, we have Council Mission come, is coming on. Okay, great. So uh, we can get started. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Um, Councilman, how you doing? Good. Chief, how you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, Director Webster, how are you? Good evening, sir. I'm well, thank you. Well, I'm, oh, we have the council president. Great. We're ready to rock and roll. Chief Barco, good to see you. Um, so um, we can begin. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. We'd like to call this uh, Quality Life and Public Safety Committee meeting uh, to order a special committee meeting uh, for today, uh, February 22nd, 2023. Uh, my name is Councilman TJ Clark. I serve as the co-chair for the Public Safety Committee, uh, as well as the majority leader for the City Council. We are joined by uh, Councilman uh, Josh Mischum and uh, Council President Mel Rosado. And we are joined by Director Sue Webster, who is the Emergency Services and Technology Director, um, Chief Jason Thody, uh, Chief of Police for Hartford uh, PD, uh, Chief Rodney Barco, uh, Chief of Fire for Hartford PD. Uh, we have our Corporation Counsel's Office here, uh, Attorney Natalie Fiola Guerrero, uh, our Council staff, uh, Sadia Lee, as well as Noelia Ortiz, and um, it appears to be a, I would say, an honorary member. Additional, disconnected. Sorry, additional honorary member of our uh, Public Safety Committee, Sergeant Chris Mastriani, um, who provides us much detail as well. So um, we'd like to get started on our agenda, which is bear with me. I apologize for not having the agenda up. So we are going to just want to also to recognize uh, some guests that we have. Um, Emela Carr Hernandez, I hope I pronounced your name right. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are also broadcasting on channel 96 on Comcast and channel 6032 on Frontier, as well as hpatv.org. Uh, and we will start off with our presentation from Director Sue Webster at this time. Good evening and thank you. Um, so this evening, I actually prepared a short presentation. I know that um, Chief Doty and Chief Barco both regularly prepare presentations. Um, so I thought it would be only appropriate if, um, if I started to do that as well. Um, so this first presentation will just be outlining some call volume with a, it's actually a 12 month comparison. Um, a rolling 12 month comparison of the call volume for both for police, fire and EMS. Um, I have some other ideas. I'd like to add some actual 911 call volume as well as administrative calls and, and some other things. So working on that with my team, I'm happy to get any input from anybody and feedback. Um, but with your permission, I would like to share my screen. Okay, do you, let me see if you have the, do you have the capability to do so? I don't. Oh, here we go. Yep, I do. All right. Perfect. Awesome. Can everyone see that? Just making sure. Okay, here we go. Um, so this first slide is telling us um, the police calls that were dispatched. Um, just for clarity, it's not telling us the number of units that actually responded to those scenes, um, but the number of dispatches altogether. So it's we count one call, even if there were two, three, six officers on any given call. So this is a just an overview of twelve of of twelve months. I did question February myself, knowing that um, this is February, but the call volume last February of 2022 was very low. Um, but you can see over a rolling 12 month period, there was a total of 120,475 calls for law enforcement. 
Um, we can see where May was an, a very active month for law enforcement. Um, and then typically we get a little bit busier in the summer. So these are our law enforcement calls over, a, again, a rolling 12 month period. Um, so next month when I show the same slide, um, we'll just move forward to March and that'll be um, the 12 month view that we look at. These are fire suppression calls um, from a dispatch perspective. Also, we're seeing that February is a slower month from the fire perspective as well. We're seeing October is a very busy month. Um, and again, these are fire dispatches, not the number of apparatus that are responding to those scenes. So over this rolling 12 month period, they responded to 21,428 fire suppression calls. Um, we also have the fire medical calls, which the fire department responds to. So um, you can see that December was a, a very busy month um, for the fire department as far as medical calls are concerned. They respond to all um, A calls or priority one calls for dispatch where they are the most critical patients. Um, so over that 12 month rolling period, they responded to 7,510 calls for service. Whoops. Uh oh. You know, I'm not going to know how to go backwards because I went too far. Oh, there we go. Um, and these are the EMS dispatch calls. So, all the calls that were responded to by either AMR or Aetna through that uh, rolling 12 month period, that was 36,571 calls. Um, these calls, some of them were also responded to by uh, the, the fire department. So adding these EMS calls to those fire calls isn't a true um, scope of what these actually calls were, um, but this is uh, the total EMS dispatch calls. So that, that was it. It was actually quite a quick presentation, um, but this is what I'm looking to do moving forward. Um, if you guys are all, on board um, with doing that. No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's most uh, appreciate appreciative uh, to put a uh, some um, you know context with some numbers. So we can see that uh, that how that volume is is very intriguing. Any um, digging in as to some of those months why like February is a slow month, but like for fire, you had a uh, had a spike for October and. Uh, May was a spike for uh, for a police department. Any correlation to knowing about those or uh, why those spikes? Um, I don't. Uh, we didn't um, really review the specific calls for service that they're responding to. Um, I know that that's something that Chief Thoe typically does in his presentation, the types of calls that they're responding to. Um, uh, so we didn't actually look at that, but we know that this was all done with our new CAD system. So the numbers are relatively um, accurate. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. For um, sure. Great presentation. Uh, any uh, questions from my council members? Committee members? No? No. All right. We can speak uh, quickly to the um, the staffing. Um, so as you all know, we put together a, a pretty big class um, a couple of months ago, actually November twenty. 21st of last year. Um, we have some very, very good candidates that we have gotten out of that class. Five of them are already starting to dispatch on patrol, cleared through call intake EMS. There's a, another group that is on the information channel. We have some on the law enforcement channel, excuse me, the fire channel, um, and they're doing very, very well. We are super excited. Um, human resources has been phenomenal. We have another class um, that, excuse me, not a class, another testing um, on the first and the second of next month. Um, last I heard, there was already 20 applicants, so they'll be tested. Um, and we are hoping to get another academy in, um, where are we now, February, probably April, um, okay. once we are able to test them, interview them, and put them through the backgrounds. Okay. And uh, how many um, candidates? Right now, there are 20 applicants, um, but we are looking to hire an additional 10. Okay. All right. Oh, perfect. Uh, Councilman Mishnam? Thank you. Um, Director Webster, I, I realize you have a question. The, the numbers that you gave us on police calls, are you, do you have, I don't mean like in this instant, but like, could you give to us like a breakdown? And this is a question I always ask the chief around budget time, like 
of the calls, how many calls involved a report of someone with a gun or like any sort of the way, I don't know how you categorize them, but is that something that you have? Is that data you could easily sort of add to a presentation like this or send to us? Uh, yes, we have the data. <clears throat> what we have to remember though, is that the data that we get at the call intake process isn't necessarily what the officer walks into. Um, we could get a call for a domestic and it ended up being um, just a simple disturbance. Um, so a, a lot of things could happen. A motor vehicle accident then turns into a disturbance. Um, so we do have those facts. Um, we don't have it broken down specifically by gun, but we do have it by weapon. Um, so I can certainly look at some of that data run it by Chief Thody and then um, share that with the group. Well I, and I appreciate that that caveat that like what comes in is not what's actually out there necessarily. Do you then later connect that follow-up information so that like you could say this call came in as a motor vehicle and it came back as a domestic or whatever? Is that well, we, yeah, we don't change anything in the call intake process. And that's something new that we've been doing, um, working with the police department, um, because we want to make sure that if it comes in as a domestic, and that's the information that we gathered, that that's how the call stands. However, the officers will change that in the records management system. So it is the appropriate call for service that, that they responded to. So we do make those changes. And through the quality improvement process, um, we listen to, because you can only get the information and, and categorize it the best way that you can based on the information the caller gives you. So we'll go through, we'll review those calls and, and make sure that the dispatchers are asking the appropriate information to dig down what the call actually is for um, and then to code it properly. But in terms of the data, you and I, I don't mean to say that, I appreciate that. In terms of the data that you could give to us, would we also be able to see like how it came in and then also, you know, of February's calls, here's what they actually were? Like you could put that in there too. Um, it's possible. I can certainly look into that for you. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think it'd be a tough correlation only because, I mean, you could, so we can run those two reports. So if someone calls to Sue's point, calls into the dispatch center, now you're dealing with the CAD, the computer aided dispatch side of, of the, of the system. And they say, um, you know, it's a domestic assault, for example, they would dispatch it appropriately. The officer shows up, the officer finds out there was no domestic partnership. There was no assault. We recode it in the records management system as like a breach of peace or something like that. So we would be able, so the, the new CAT RMS system running the reports on the RMS side is something that we're kind of still figuring out, um, but we will be able to do that. So we will be able to give you the numbers out of the RMS side and the numbers out of the CAD side. But to say, you know, this call turned into this would be a literal line yeah. by line. You know, I didn't need to ask for that. I really okay. just wanted the raw numbers. So yeah, the <laughs> aggregate numbers we could we could definitely provide on both sides. Cool. Thank I, you. I agree with Chief. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Director Webster? None? Okay, great. Uh, Director Webster, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome to stay on um, for the rest of the meeting if you choose to. And uh, uh, next we have our uh, presentation by uh, Chief Rodney Barco. Good evening, Councilman Clark and um, Council President Rosano and everyone else on the call. Uh, I got to apologize tonight. We we have a, a new records management system. So some of the extrapolating, some of the data has been difficult. We're still working on that process. Um, as you know, or didn't know, we had pretty much three record management systems. We have Firehouse, um, we got PS Tracks, and then we had another system called ESO. Um, the reason we, why we had so many is because uh, Firehouse was our original records management system, which is no longer being supported um, by that company or by any updates by, from Windows. So we moved on to ESO, who uh, now got bought out by another company. And so we sought out the a vendor that was instrumental in developing Firehouse started his own company called AFD. Um, so we've been working with that software for about uh, five to six months. The first three months was a trial run. 
what I had him do was uh, give us access to that software. Uh, we used it. Our firefighters used it when they went on calls, came back with their reports, made sure it was something that was going to work for the department and um, that we had access to the software in, in terms of being able to manipulate it and develop reports. So um, that side of it we're still working on, um, extrapolating data from the software and, and putting it into a report that uh, we can present. So some of the data for this particular report is going to be limited to um, just what we did as a department, not so much in terms of calls for service. But we're looking to have that all worked out by next month. So I'm going to Thank share you. my screen. Yeah. Uh, can everyone see that? Is the PowerPoint? Oh, there we go. No, it hasn't come it hasn't come on. Oh. One second. Sure. There we go. All right, so for general updates um, in terms of HFD, we've already taken the written for the uh, captain's test for training and the captain test of uh, suppression. Right now, actually tomorrow, we'll be doing the oral assessment for both positions. Um, that is gonna take approximately half of the day uh, for training captain and fire suppression captain. We recently promoted four new FMO lieutenant. As you all know, um, there's a lot of projects going up in the city in terms of new construction. So those extra uh, FMO lieutenants will be instrumental in doing plan reviews, uh, doing inspections, and helping along with the process as they uh, try to rehab some older buildings and also um, construct some newer ones. Uh, we completed our budget uh, review process last week, asked for a couple of things, uh, reviewed a couple of funding issues, um, and we're just waiting to hear back from the mayor's office. And then awaiting results of our five new fire cadets, the background checks and the physicals. Uh, three of those candidates are former explorers uh, who just got who applied for the position of cadets, so we chose them, and two of them are outside. This is the month of January in terms of what our special uh, services unit has completed. Uh, as you can see, it's an extensive amount of work for three people. Uh, I've also asked for an additional special services lieutenant in the budget. Uh, hopefully, I'll get that. But uh, that team in itself does amazing work when it comes to outreach to the community and uh, relaying our message for the fire for from the fire department to the community. Um, so <clears throat> I did mention the uh, cadets. So they begin promoting the winter fire safety tips. You can see on the left. This is a flyer that they put on social media. Uh, they generally have a theme each month as it pertains to fire safety. And they, they do those flyers in English and in Spanish. And then they also have this uh, QR code here. If you scan it, more information comes up. Uh, they do a lot of apparatus displays that's um, for school presentations or whichever community uh, NRG requests it. Um, that is usually associated with the nearest firehouse. So special services division sets up the appointment, the firehouse goes out, and usually you'll have one member from SSU who will sit in and do a presentation. Still in the process of distributing COVID-19 supplies as requested, uh, attended a CROG meeting, uh, senior citizen presentation at Ida B. Wells, we do a lot of fire safety house presentations for uh, the local schools. 
um, career conversation interviews at a uh, sports medicine science academy. And that's just to try to get the younger folks interested in a career in the fire service. And so you can see um, the amount of stuff that they do on an, in, in actually just one month. So to summarize, they provide a fire safety information to 451 adults, 919 children for a total of 1,370 uh, people installed 31 smoke detectors, uh, relocated five families, 14 people, nine adults, and five children, and attended 14 community meeting events. Our, our, our fire response scorecard, and again, we've switched to a new records management system, but this is our citywide fire response for the month of December. We were in the 80th percentile as it pertains to structure fires, and we had 10 during the month of December. EMS scorecard, uh, slight declination from the previous month with 1,116 calls for service. And again, as you well know, our demographics for the department, pretty even across the board, 35, 33, and 31% in terms of uh, ethnic, ethnicity. Um, and that's all I have for the current presentation. Uh, any questions? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I don't have any questions. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have any questions. Uh, nope, none. As I see, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Chief. Nothing. All right. no, nothing. <laughs> I'm always willing to answer questions. I know. No, I, I, I think yeah, we typically do. I think you beat the record uh, today for our presentation. So yeah. And again, I apologize. I'll make sure I have that squared away by uh, next uh, quality of life meeting. Thank you. Um, I just one quick question regarding the new uh, uh, software. Is is that uh, the new software um, more cost prohibitive than the fire? Uh, sorry, than the previous uh, software? How does that work out from a budgetary standpoint? Uh, it's a, it's a it's a saving, significant savings. It's about um, twenty thousand a year. The initial upfront cost was um, a little bit more. Software is just really expensive, but once we get rid of everything else, we it end up being cheaper just having this one platform. And the one platform covers everything that. Yes, sir. Okay. So for FMO suppression, um, we're even doing driver checklists and inventory, um, our daily roster, um, and we recently just went to uh, split shifts where we allow. Uh, the fire department is a 24-hour shift, but we just started allowing folks to do 10-hour uh, days and 14-hour um, nights, so they're able to work the day shift and take like a vacation or earn day on the night shift, which 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 helps out a lot too in terms of overtime as well. They're able to split the overtime, so we offer them a 24-hour shift or a day or a night, and they they have the ability to choose which one they want to work. And it cuts down on um, the 212, the overage as well. So we're trying to, you know, make some, not a lot, not, but small changes, fix a few things. Um, we just redid our accreditation. Um, that's up for review at the beginning of next year, 2024. So okay. we're, we're in a good position right now. Now, with that that change, I did hear some um, chatter about that. Uh, but so, with that change, is that more to pre uh, prevent a burnout and try to save on OT? Yeah, it's just preventing the the overage and overtime, the two twelve, the time and a half. So, uh, once an individual is over two hundred and twelve hours in the thirty day period or thirty one day period, then you have to start paying them time and a half. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chief, for your presentation. You are as well welcome to stay on. And uh, next we have um, our Chief of Police, Jason Thody. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Am I sharing my screen here? Yep, it's already up. Okay. Nice backdrop, by the way. I know. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sergeant Jenkins really, uh, really yeah. took it to another level here. I saw it. You, when I opened. you all stepped it up. I love it. <laughs> I'm not messing around. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to take credit, but I think everyone on this call knows better. I can't wait to the budget presentation to see what uh, what's going to be flashy. Like. <laughs> going to be flashy for sure. <laughs> All right, so we'll go over uh, we'll go over some of this stuff. We'll we'll kind of jump right in here. Um, this is our uh, Comstat stats for for uh, week ending uh, last last Saturday. As you can see, you know we're still early on in the year. It takes us sometimes a little while to start developing some of these trends, but uh, aggravated assault overall down sixteen percent. Aggravated assault with a firearm down 25%, um, rape up 75%, which is three incidents. Um, robbery up 47%, robbery with a firearm 55%, auto theft 47%, burglary is zero, larceny is down 32% for an overall reduction so far in the year of 11%. Uh, homicide victims are down. Uh, one versus three um, this time last year, so down 67%, and shooting victims down three uh, for a 15% reduction. Um, in those numbers, um, we see some, some patterns emerging with robberies. Uh, we also saw earlier in the year uh, an increase in burglaries. Uh, we worked together in the last couple of ComStat um, meetings to, to work more closely on kind of a collaborative effort within the department where uh, division commanders were tasked with uh, coming up with kind of new and innovative ideas and, and presenting ideas about how we can uh, reduce some of those uh, property crimes. As you can see, some of the, the more violent crimes that we've um, struggled with last year are, are trending in the right direction. So we've uh, diverted our focus um, for a little while here to these robberies. Um, and so um, Folks are out there, uh, we're doing extra patrols. We've uh, bolstered our, our crime scene responses, had sergeants review whether crime scene should respond or not to get forensic evidence. And uh, we have a presentation tomorrow on some more long-term uh, efforts to, uh, to reduce those robbery numbers, which are the most concerning ones. A lot of them, um, honestly, are uh, larceny turned robbery. Uh, the difference is that a larceny, you know, somebody goes into Walmart or CVS, those are, those are some of our higher uh, numbers of larcenies and they steal something, um, they stick it in their pocket uh, when they walk out the door. Uh, if, if, they, if they don't resist in any way, it is a larceny. If they pull away from loss prevention or, or shove a loss prevention person and run, it automatically turns into a robbery. So a large percentage of those, of those robberies that we're seeing um, are that. Uh, they're they're uh, kind of larceny turned into a robbery when uh, someone tries to get away. Um, so we're looking at ways to mitigate that with, with some of our, our, our bigger areas of larceny, which, like I said, are like CVS, Walmart, um, Walgreens, some of those places. So um, that is a work in progress. Whoa. Uh, firearm seizures, we're at 51 total for the year. Um, as everybody knows, 367 total uh, last year. Uh, handguns, 48 of the 51 only one rifle, one shotgun. Ghost guns are at two. Uh, we're starting to track some other areas here. Chris, who's on the call, uh, is instrumental in some of this firearms tracking. For those that saw it, we did a, a press release with um, Senator Murphy on Monday for universal background checks. We used a lot of Chris's data in our gun collections to try to um, support uh, the Senator's efforts to get that universal background check legislation through. Um, Mayor Bronin was there as well with Mother Jeanette Against Violence and some others. Um, we're now tracking high capacity magazines, uh, altered firearms and things like that. Um, as everyone may also know, uh, the, the mayor um, presented some legislative changes where we could make a category about serious firearm offenses to try to cut down on some of these uh, repeat offenders that are, uh, you know, that are getting arrested two and three and four times for serious uh, assaults with a firearm, um, felony gun charges and things like that. Um, so that's, uh, this is all the data that we're kind of using to support some of those, those efforts. Uh, but 51 thus far in the year is a significant number. Uh, we may actually eclipse this 367 uh, number. 
These are some of the pictures, as you can see in the center there. Uh, we have an assault rifle uh, seizure there. Vice Intelligence Narcotics Division, uh, off to a, a, a busy start, especially in the first three weeks of January. Uh, 5,383 bags of fentanyl, um, 3,865 grams of fentanyl, 253 grams of crack, um, 2,391 grams of cocaine, already $31,000 seized, and we've already done 10 search warrants uh, in February, uh, in January and February. Um, so we're going to see those uh, numbers continue to go up. Uh, as I've said before, this was a, a concerted effort to look at the violence associated with the drug trade. And as a result, in 2022, we saw a 29% decrease in um, drug-related shootings and homicides. So we're going we're gonna to keep these initiatives going. Occupied stolen motor vehicles and, and motor vehicle arrests, we're at 14 for the year. We're still using the Greater Hartford Regional Auto Theft Task Force approach, which has been very successful both here, um, here in our neighboring, in our 11 neighboring towns that, that work with us, um, but 14 cars recovered and, and 14 arrests. Traffic statistics, total stops 1,504. Uh, 870 of those come directly out of the traffic division, 677 total infractions issued, 623 of those coming from the traffic division, 24 DUI arrests, and 12 stolen vehicles recovered um, by the traffic division. Um, as you can see, this is a breakdown of what the charges were, 171 speeding, 83 cell phone, 58 seat belts, 66 stop sign, uh, 109 traffic control signal and 190 other. So our focus is still on those core moving violations that are, uh, that are impacting road safety. And that is what we have for today. Thanks uh, for your presentation. Um, I do open the floor to my colleagues for questions. Uh, Councilman Mishto. I actually have a question that's related to a later item on the agenda. So I'm really just going to ask Chief, are you going to stick around so I can ask you when we get to that? Yeah, I'll be here for the whole thing. Okay, then I'll wait. Sure. Um, any other questions regarding the presentation? Um, one quick question. Wanna say, I just want to say, Chief, uh, thank you for that um, presentation. And I'm going to be sending you um, an email um, just on, you know, some questions like how many officers do we have on the force right now? I know a class graduated a total, a total amount. And, you know, when the, when the class comes off field training, we'll be at 383. Wonderful. We're at 365 functional. I say functional because the field training officers are, are with, um, you know, they're with their field training. Um, they're with their person doing training, so they don't really count. Um, but 383 will be the number that we will be at if everyone successfully completes their field training. We graduated 18 a couple of weeks ago. I saw that. And what is the goal number, Chief, for a completely staffed uh, department? We have budgeted vacancies. We're at three, I'm sorry, 472 budgeted vacancies right now. Um, you know, that, that kind of comes off that 475 number from the staffing analysis that was done, I think, back in 16. So we're, we're that being at 383 will be, I never thought I'd say it, but that's a, it's a good number right now. Um, if we can, we have another class starting in April, you know, I'd, I'd like to get us at least to that 400 number. You know, when we were when we were at 430, 435 is when we had the 24 walk beats. And that was, you know, once we kind of get past that 420 mark, we're filling regular patrol shifts without ordering too many cops in. Uh, and that's where we get to kind of see some of those extras that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, it was great when we were up to the 24 walk beats, seeing, seeing the officers out there on bicycles and in the community and stuff was great. So um, I'm hoping to at least try to get back to that so we can start seeing some of those officers um, out walking around again. Wonderful. Thank you, Chief. Welcome. How many cars do we uh, have now on patrol? Is it 20, 24 still? Or 23? It's 21 on midnights, which is the lowest um, staffing number we have. It goes up as high as 27 on, on evening shift. 
um, 23, 24 on days. We adjust it. Um, as you saw some of the call numbers that uh, Director Webster presented, uh, we do adjust the minimum staffings for time of year. Um, when we see the call start to increase in April, May, June, we increase the mandatory minimums as well. Okay. And um, the uh, mental health calls. So with the, the heart team, I believe it's called, do you, is there any data on that as to how many um, calls for response services that would the team or companies uh, PD to go out for, for these calls? Yeah, Patricia has a lot of that data. We just had a meeting on um, some of the kind of uh, one year look uh, data that, that she has. She's going to be presenting that soon. Um, I don't, you know, she kind of compiles that, so I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, but some of the numbers were pretty impressive. Um, the numbers of calls that just the mental health workers are going out to themselves is increasing, which is the goal, um, which is good as well. So um, I, I would look for that report soon. Um, we've looked at a couple drafts of it, so it should be coming out shortly. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe we should uh, contact her for um, a public safety presentation because uh, I think myself included were, is very much interested in seeing, you know, the success of that program and, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's taking place. It's, it's hard to believe it's been over a year uh, regarding that. Um, we are um, actually working with a lot of other departments um, that are coming in and examining that program. We've had, I can't think of, Chris, do you remember the specific agencies that are coming in? Um, a couple of pretty major cities though, that are visiting us and um, asking our cops about how it's going and stuff. So it's really become quite a model. So I think that would be a good idea. Okay. Thank you for that. All right, perfect. Um, <clears throat> no other questions regarding the uh, police chief's uh, presentation. Uh, we will go move forward with a item number four resolution uh, from Council President Rosado to create and implement a comprehensive uh, crime prevention strategy. Council yeah. President. Yes, so being the maker of the resolution, I'd like to postpone this to the next month. I mean, this resolution has a lot of moving parts, and we just finished uh, a meeting um, in late December with the clergy um, and got some input, um, which then I will um, sit down and, and, and have a meeting with uh, Chief Thody to kind of go over a couple of things and, and, and you know, other uh, departments and nonprofits. So I'd like to make a motion to postpone this to the next council meeting. Motion has been made to postpone. Is there a second? Second has been made by uh, Council Mitchell. Motion has been made by Council President Rosado. Any other questions? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 This is unanimous. The ayes have it. This uh, item is postponed until the next meeting. Uh, moving forward, item five is resolution by Councilman Sanchez and uh, LeBron regarding the facial recognition technology, uh, which was most recently, recently on our agenda for uh, January 23rd, um, there was an amendment I know discussed back and forth, but um, I believe the none are here. So is there a motion to postpone? Motion to postpone. Motion to made by Council President Rosado, seconded by Council Mishtam. Uh, any other discussion on the favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, ayes have it, this item is postponed to our next meeting. And finally, finally, our last item on the agenda is a resolution by Mayor Broner with the company resolution to confirm the appointment of Emma Carr uh, Hernandez to the Civilian Police Review Board, which was on our February 14th uh, agenda. So we have Mr. Hernandez here. And uh, first I wanna say thank you for your willingness to serve on uh, CPRB. It is, um, quite a task uh, to serve as a commissioner uh, on this committee. And um, uh, please let us know, uh, introduce yourself and let us know who you are and why you're inter interested in serving on the, this important committee. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Amilcar Hernandez. I live and work here in Hartford. Um, just for like a little bit of background, I, I work here at OPP, our piece of the pie. I've been here for about 16 years. Um, so I, and I live on the Southwest, uh, side of the town. Um, and I, uh, I'm also part of the, uh, all the boards. I'm the vice chair for the, uh, Southwest NRZ. And I'm also the uh, treasurer for CICD, uh, Puerto Rican parade. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, some of the other, um, you know, 
things that I do, you know, with my time. And then the little bit left after that, then, you know, I just do the regular stuff, you know, home, you know, with my kid and uh, enjoying, you know, the nice uh, neighborhood where I lived. Um, I think the, uh, I, I, I don't know if this was part of the question, but um, uh, one of the things that I was very interested in joining this board, um, you know, once I had a kind of like a brief conversation with uh, uh, with the mayor and then subsequently with some other um, uh, folks, you know, pre council president and some other people that I, I wanted to kind of get a, little, get a little bit more information of what this is and 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 the uh, uh, what the expectations are. Um, I think the one uh, item that it's a perfect alignment for me is that I have, a, and I would kind of, I would say this very humble. I'll be very humble saying this, but I have I have the ability of being extremely objective and very neutral. I do. I could assess situations. I could go into uh, any particular situation, any particular conversation, and I could put uh, some of my ideals and whatever other uh, uh, preconceived notions I have, uh, unconscious biases. I could just put everything to the side and look at any situation in a very objective way. Uh, and I think that that's one of the uh, uh, reasons that uh, I think the mayor thought that I was going to be a good match because I think he saw a little bit of that in some of the uh, meetings that I've had with him uh, in other matters. And, and I think that that's, uh, uh, that's kind of like the one key item that I know I could bring to the table. Uh, and, but also uh, because this is, uh, I have a stake on this. You know, I live in the city of Hartford. I work in the city of Hartford. Uh, I work at our piece of the pie, which we deal with a lot of, uh, you know, young people. Um, you know, many of them just is involved. Uh, so, so there is, you know, a lot of correlation, you know, between uh, my environment, um, you know, and the effective, you know, policing in, in the city. Um, so I think that this is a match, you know, in every way I look at it. Uh, but I think that my ability to uh, research, uh, study, I, I like to get educated, informed. Uh, as soon as I knew that we were doing this, I, I kind of went crazy online and I started reading the history of how these review boards came about, not only in the city of Hartford, but just, you know, nationwide, uh, you know, what failed in other cities, why it didn't work out in other cities, what changes happened. Uh, then I read the new, you know, um, um, the different, you know, uh, latest legislative, you know, measures that kind of came through uh, and gave some CRB, you know, some uh, investigative and subpoena powers. And I started reading the why, the pros and the cons. Uh, you know, just to inform myself and know exactly, uh, you know, what the expectations are, uh, what my duty is. And, and, and I think that's kind of like, you know, what I did, you know, uh, in the last, you know, few weeks and a few months, uh, just to kind of educate myself. Uh, and then from here on, then I just have to learn a lot more. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction again, uh, your willingness to, to serve and I know you, uh, done some work for uh, the council president and, and council. So I hope that, that that has been very informative and in helping to shape and form your decision to serve on CPMD. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, board as you're uh, well aware from, from your research. And uh, yes, we took a lot of time to do some uh, formative measures to revamp this, uh, revamp this. I believe that part of the problem have been in the past is the fact that it's been hard to get a quorum so uh, I'm hoping that you will be fully invested and committed uh, to making sure that you are present so that we can um, uh, be able to um, work uh, to, get the, to get some things done on, on the committee. Um, any uh, questions for uh, Mr. Hernandez? Councilman Mitchell? Oh, I see the council president had her hand up too. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Councilman okay. Mitchell. Thanks. Uh, so Mr. Hernandez, yeah. I, I, I second the sentiment that like we really appreciate you stepping up because having folks who are going to put the time in is what makes the thing work. Um, I have I think I just have two questions. And I the first one, I realized, you know, this is not the PARB, right? You're not signing up for a policy making job. And I'm just curious in terms of your outlook. If you could change one thing about the way police operate in our city, just, you know, based on what you've seen at work, OPP, your own experience, like, what would that be? Uh, I mean, again, I, I don't know if this is something that's being done. So I, I want to be fair to say that I don't know if this is being done. Uh, I, I guess in the upcoming months, I will learn a little bit more about the uh, uh, the actual, you know, what gets done on the streets. I only see them, you know, passing by the house. I don't have any contact with any of them, right? Uh, but I will say the one thing that, that in a perfect world that I would love to see 
uh, is to uh, see a lot more of the community relationship, uh, community policing relationship piece of it. And, and I know I like I, we have a CSO at the uh, at the Southwest, and I, I I know him because I I'm part of the NRC. Uh, but to see them, you know, uh, uh, more in the community, doing things with the community, I think that's one thing that I think will be very effective. And I know that obviously not having enough police officers right now may be a, a, a little bit of a challenge to get that done. Uh, but that's the one thing that I would definitely would like to improve or enhance is that community policing kind of like being there and, and do things outside of just the policing you know just walk up the streets you know with them talk to them about whatever you know it doesn't have to be because there's a situation just regular contact gotcha and then my second question is i'm just curious because your resume says that you went to high school in philly and i have a whole bunch of my family in west philly so i'm curious where in philly you were north, north philly in north philadelphia yeah i went to high school there so sadly we lost but what are you gonna do next year all right thank you i got nothing else yeah full cowboys as always (laughs) (laughs) council (laughs) council president yes um i really don't have any questions but you know i i worked uh with Amilka, you know, uh, in my office and kind of build a relationship outside in the community so i know he's going to be a great asset to the uh, civilian police review board. So um, thank you um, for serving, you know, on the board. And um, I look forward to uh, the great things that you guys will do on the uh, civilian police review board. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I believe that we still have, excuse me, have some vacancies. Two that I'm aware of is a justice involved person. Right. And I don't remember, I know councilman, you were looking to push somebody maybe from a, um, a youth standpoint, I don't remember if we actually put that in, but at least the justice involved person is 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 needed. And so, my and ask after you, um, uh, Majority Leader Clark, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, Mayor has reached out um, to Council um, for a recommendation um, for the justice involved. So, um, I'd love to have a conversation with you and see if um, we could get the Council colleagues together and 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 send a couple of recommendations uh, to the Mayor for the justice involved. And say sure. get get your input also to uh, Councilman Mitchum um, for that, and and come up with at least five recommendations. Okay. And also to Amilcar, uh, if you have a, a recommendation as well, uh, we would love to uh, we love to ha- have that. Um, any other questions from my colleagues? Uh, all right, uh, to chair, entertain the motion. I'd like to make a motion uh, to send. Um, this uh, resolution back to council with a favorable recommendation. And Mr. Chair, I believe uh, Councilman Sanchez just joined us for the record. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, motion has been made by Council President Rosado for favorable recommendation back to council. Second. Second by Council Mitchstone. Um, the chair also would like to recognize the incoming of our co-chair, Councilman Sanchez. Good evening, sir. Um, is there uh, any uh, any discussion regarding uh, this resolution? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor on the favorable recommendation indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposals? None. Uh, the ayes have it. It's unanimous. Uh, this item is passed. Uh, back to council favorable recommendation. All right. Uh, being that we don't, just double checking. No. Nope. Being that we don't have any other business to discuss of this committee, uh, for this meeting. Uh, our uh, meeting is adjourned for the night. So thank you very much and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Chief. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night.